Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. It's a Monday morning. We are joined by Dean Neubauer, uh, and he is emeritus at political science at UH, but has had many years in education as well as political science, and spent a lot of time in the in in the Orient in Asia. Now, I wish I'd spent as much time that, as he has there. <laughs> so you take those two things, and he's the perfect guest for today's show. And today's show is is all about how education maybe could fix some of the problems we have seen in democracy over the past few years. Welcome to the show, Dean. Thank you. It's pleased to be here. You must have thought about this as you see, uh, you know, on our democracy unravel. I mean, if you're a political scientist uh, or a lawyer, and I, I, you know, I have sensibilities on it too, um, you know, you make certain assumptions about the, um, the quality of our democracy and how important it is for the, you know, for the quality of civic life, if you will. Um, and we have lost that in, in so many ways over the past few years. And I wonder if you could comment on, you know, the state of our democracy, for one thing, uh, from the eyes of a political science uh, professor, educator, uh, how does it look? Well, you know, as, as I started to think about this, uh, I wished we had a semester. Uh, <laughs> because, True. <laughs> well, I, I started uh, a couple of days ago an exercise after you asked me to do this, an exercise uh, in which I made some notes about the, the subject matter as you had laid it out. And every one of those terms uh, exploded on me. Uh, higher education, better uh, democracy, et cetera. Uh, and that is part of uh, the issue and part of the reality here, because um, it, it is not as if democracy is a thing. It both is and isn't. It is an extraordinarily complex process in which, um, in, in by now, in this case, uh, millions of people participate with vastly different understandings of what it is that uh, the thing is, uh, what their role is, what they're doing, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, similarly, uh, with, uh, with the way you phrase this about uh, better education, I got into uh, a, a bit of a thought pattern about what constitutes better education and um, is better education that which we do at the most expensive schools. Uh, some would have you believe that. Uh, but um, is better education what comes out when we test people and those who test the highest uh, say they have the better education, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then flip around once again to uh, let me share just a very brief part of my uh, background. When I was getting my uh, doctoral degree, uh, I uh, went to study under a person who was then very famous in, in American political science, Robert Dahl. And um, I chose as my dissertation subject, uh, essentially, can you measure uh, democracy? And I invented uh, some scales for that and then uh, later wrote some, uh, some articles that I published. And, they were very, very interesting from several perspectives. Uh, one is that I was astonished at uh, what you could see if you uh, got the right indicators. And then when I published, I was really impressed with the people who wrote back to me with critiques about what I was doing. And the critiques essentially said, um, as, we, as we say in much of social life, uh, what you see is where you look. Uh, so uh, that, that's the way it is with democracy. What you see is where you look. Uh, just one more thing as a prefactory remark, and then, then we'll turn this around a little bit. Um, as you indicate, I've been working in higher education for the last uh, several years, particularly in Asia. And one of the phenomena that has, uh, that has occurred uh, over, over the last 15 years is the passion uh, throughout the world, but especially in Asia, to do with higher education what I was doing with democracy, which is in essence to create a scale, uh, to create a ranking, to be able to say uh, this thing is more democratic than that thing. Only now we're doing it with higher education. And uh, so who's got the highest, who's got the best uh, rankings? And the presumption is because the notion is that the scales are good, 
that the highest ranking means you're the best. Well, it, it, it is a signal and important that this was an informal process run in the United States and, and in Britain largely uh, for about 35 years and didn't really have much effect. It took off in Asia uh, at the, shortly after the turn of the century when Jingtai University in Shanghai created rankings for uh, Asian universities. And then that phenomenon came to have a, a life of its own. And part of the life is that um, you, uh, it's like a recipe, a ranking is like a recipe. The recipe tells you what ingredients you need. The rankings are all about what the indicators are. So uh, in this instance, uh, it turns out that the indicators are vastly biased in the direction of research. And uh, that works for these Asian societies largely because that's where they are. They are trying to uh, gain status in the world. They're trying to infuse their social economic systems, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But what does that say about the goodness, as it were, of, of the education? And we're back into this business now about what the indicators are. Uh, so they're essentially saying that uh, the more better research you do, uh, the better university you are. And, um, and then we see how circular that becomes. So as I was thinking about the subject matter you've chosen for today, uh, once again, every single one of those terms has this capability. Um, does better education tell us how to improve democracy? Uh, what do we mean by better education? What do we mean by, uh, by democracy? And by all means, what do we mean by better? Uh, so um, I wish there were, uh, for me at least, a, a more simple way to think about this. But um, I, I think in reality, there is not. And let me just put one more frame on this and then we can open the discussion. I think what, uh, what democracies have become throughout the world and all the different forms that they have are inseparable from their institutional manifestations. Now that sounds like political science-y talk, uh, but what I mean by that is that um, the, the institutions by which uh, a democratic society um, expresses itself um, is, is, is what it means in the world. And those historically, as we know, have been uh, legislatures uh, and executives um, and judiciaries. And then as the world became increasingly complex, particularly uh, with the industrial revolution and the end of the 19th century, we saw that the administrative component, uh, the bureaucracies, as you were, uh, become equally or even more important because that's where the stuff gets done. Uh, and then, um, et, et cetera. And then uh, the, the most recent revolution and the one that we've only begun to talk about, although we all, <laughs> when we talk about it, uh, purport to be experts about it, um, is uh, the, the incredible extent to which uh, social media has changed the world in which we live. Uh, so uh, if one wanted to have a serious conversation in the way that you've laid it out in the topic, uh, better, uh, better education uh, for, uh, for our, our social outcomes, as it were, uh, one would have to put first and foremost in that, uh, this thing about which we know so much and yet so little. And that's the degree to which social media is changing the world, uh, the, the way we see the world, experience the world. And here's the important part, make judgments about the world. Mm -hmm. And certainly we saw that in the election. Uh, we've seen that in, in the post-election shenanigans, uh, et cetera. So I'm, um, you know, I'm, I'm afraid for me, uh, the way that you phrase the question doesn't admit to any easy answers, although uh, goodness only knows it certainly uh, creates the basis for a political science course at uh, any level. Okay, I'll give you my reactions on, on uh, you know, sort of gestalt reactions on that. Uh, number one, uh, my reaction is that education in this country anyway, 
has changed and the goals of it, the mechanics of it, the institution of it, the business of it has changed and not for the better. Uh, not when you're talking about building citizens. And I imagine if you looked at the, at the classroom in Illinois, uh, when uh, Abe Lincoln went to school, a lot of it was dedicated to building citizens. It was civics. Uh, it was how to relate to you know, the, the government and the people uh, in a social compact um, to make them useful citizens. And I think uh, somewhere along the line, we, we forgot about that, probably because the world got much, much more complex. And we, and we forgot our standards uh, and our original mission in, in American education. So now what you have is that you described it, uh, you know, it's a business, it's very expensive, uh, it's measured on things perhaps that really don't count if you're trying to keep the country together, uh, those civics things, those citizenship things. And it's uh, nobody's fault except we really weren't watching the story, we weren't realizing, you know, the implications of losing our um, ability to relate to the government, to understand the government, to be part of the government. Okay? That's one thing. And then the other side of it is, of course, um, you know, the, um, the political science side. And it goes to the same point, I think, namely that we have forgotten about um, being part of the government. Uh, there's a disconnect between the citizen, such as he is or she is, and the government. They, um, the, the citizen um, uh, may pay taxes, but he may try to game the system. The citizen has no particular loyalty um, to trying to make it a better country for everyone. Um, and although there are some people that feel that way, an enormous number of people don't feel that way. Furthermore, a lot of people take the assumption um, that the government will get along even if they don't participate. And somehow it's a bottomless pit of money. Somehow it's a bottomless pit of resources. And, and somehow it'll take care of us, uh, you know, when the going gets tough. None, none of those assumptions are really good. And we've seen that in Trump's uh, draining the swamp. His own swamp is what it is. And so what we have now is a, is a real disconnect between the government, which is damaged, and I want to ask you about that, um, and the citizenry, which is not educated about how that works and what his relationship or her relationship is to that government. So this is, these are all the marks of huge impending failure. So I guess, um, I guess it's clear, it's easy to conclude that the educational system isn't teaching the relationship of the citizen and the government. But the other part is how badly damaged from a political science point of view is our government? How, when we look at the Congress, it's, uh, it's, it's dysfunctional, non-functional even. We're gonna have another uh, you know, uh, crisis over funding the government here in a week or two. Um, we are, we are, our foreign policy is completely out of whack. Um, you know, our, all our policies, immigration policy, uh, our climate change, economics policies, they're all out of whack. The government is not functioning. The courts are, are being stacked to the point where you can't rely on them for justice. Um, people are losing confidence, have already lost confidence in the government's ability. Uh, and and thank, thanks to Trump, uh, the, there's n you know, no jurisdiction that's exempt from that loss of confidence. So, <clears throat> so it seems to me that from a political science point of view, it must pain you greatly to see these great institutions of American democracy um, not only deteriorate, but willfully, maliciously deteriorate right in front of our eyes uh, and when there's no immediate solution. And I guess uh, the other point is how, you know, how badly damaged are we in the face of the need to correct those things? Is it correctable and how long will it take? That's a question that there's, it deserves a one semester discussion, but let's see if we can get to it. What do you think about that? How, how badly damaged is our democracy right now? Significantly significantly. And, uh, and I, I confess, I have a small group of people that um, I spend my idle time with walking and chatting and, and that sort of thing. Uh, many of whom are uh, former students of mine who have uh, developed uh, careers in one kind or another uh, here. Uh, in this group, all of us live in Hawaii. And so we had uh, what we call the, the double whammy. Uh, and, and one part of the whammy is looking uh, at uh, this constituted uh, four-year American government uh, as something which is uh, uh, so fundamentally uh, different from anything we've seen before. 
uh, that the notion that even when we started talking about this a couple of years ago, we were still in this notion that there are partisan extremes uh, with, within, um, uh, within uh, the phenomena that are happening. Well, then you go back into that and say, well, what does partisan mean, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and uh, increasingly over uh, the four years, we uh, came to the conclusion that many others have that uh, what we're looking at is a, um, a group of people who are uh, willing and prepared for their own reasons and own purposes. And, and dear me, I, will, I do not wish to go a second further without talking as we always do about how this con uh, country like, like the global economy has slid to the direction of the 1% uh, who increasingly control more and more the wealth, not only of this society, but of the world and who buy political systems as a consequence. And there's no gain saying that, although we try and we try mightily to overlook the damage and, and the shenanigans that, that people like the Koch brothers and Sheldon uh, Edison uh, and, and those folks can do within a system, which we have to recognize is enormously vulnerable to that sort of thing as we saw uh, in the election and, and, and as we've seen before. So if I can just slide this over a few degrees and say, if we say the perspective is more the political economic perspective on democracy, then what, what you have to say is uh, we, need, we need a broader perspective. We need to look at uh, what the last uh, 30, 40 years of, uh, of globalization did to the organization of wealth in the world, uh, how that affected political institutions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So now to slip back another uh, couple of degrees to the right, we see all of this stuff happening with Trump and we look at the silence of the Republican party in its institutional manifestations. And we say, goodness gracious, what can that be about? And ultimately it is about the fundamental notion of staying in power, period. To, 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 to gain and regain office is one of the principal uh, aspects of, of politics. And it has been, and we can follow this throughout the, the history of the country, uh, from, from, from one era to another, different strategies emerged as to how to do that. Uh, and sometimes post hoc, we call that corrupt. Uh, if we were to post hoc this and say, what possibly can explain the behavior? And forgive me in, in putting in these partisan terms, but that's the way I'm thinking about it. What possibly can explain the behavior of the Republican party in, in, in the Congress? in the face of, of, of this behavior on the part of Donald Trump. Uh, and um, it's about a lot of things, but for me, number one on that list uh, is uh, we need to stay in power and we'll do anything to do that. Uh, well, slide your terms over. And once again, that's what autocracy is about, staying in power irrespective of what the institutional norms are. Uh, but it, it is uh, in the United States, autocracy is not a familiar conversation. Uh, we are not accustomed to using that uh, uh, with respect to our own government. Uh, even when we went through period after period, uh, sometimes in the South, but not, not fully in the South, where we had totally corrupt legislatures and, and governors who were organizing uh, their political power to for largely for the purpose of uh, of promoting racist uh, racial agendas. Um, we did not call that autocracy. We called it something else. Uh, and, and, you know, Trump, uh, Trump has opened up uh, new dimensions of behavior, which, uh, which the Republican party at the highest levels has bought into. Uh, I confess that I spent a fair amount of time, I'm gonna say this and then. Let me jump in and, uh, and uh, ask you the, um... The, the Charles Dickens question, um, which is, uh, what about the ghost of Christmas future? Because um, we have we have a problem, uh, and 
And the problem is the government is not functional right now. It, it is an autocracy right now. He, he somehow early on created this by you know, nullifying uh, the bureaucracy, by nullifying Congress, by nullifying the courts. He's taken away all the, you know, the major institutions by which we practice government. And then on top of that, um, he has made tremendous strides in undoing our voting system. Um, there was an article in the Times this morning about how, uh, yeah, he's losing all these cases, but he's creating a, a stream of culture and precedent in the courts, very damaging in future elections. Uh, it's, a, it's a new brand of federalism, if you will, and it doesn't work well. So my, my ghost of Christmas future is if we keep on doing this, um, if um, Mitch McConnell stays you know, uh, recalcitrant in the Senate and we can't get anything done with Biden, assuming he is timely sworn in, um, then what happens to the country? First of all, I, mean, I would make a guess and, and ask for your response. First of all, we decline. We decline worldwide. We decline economically. We decline, obviously we are declining in healthcare. Uh, vaccine or no vaccine, we have declined. Um, and then the, the second question is, uh, you know, it can't stay this way. It can't, you know, autocracies in, in the modern era do not last. Uh, there will have to be a, a change of regime. There will have to be a change of re regime either um, peacefully or violently. This country cannot, if that's the case, this country cannot continue to exist under the mantle of an ostensible democracy, it simply won't be a democracy and it will suffer. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, well, we've got three minutes. Um, <laughs> that's, that's uh, I, I, yes, I'm, I'm gonna go to, to answering that question, but I want us to slide back a little bit and realize the degree to which we've been complicit with this behavior for such a long time. This has been a dysfunctional institutional arrangement for a long time. So during those hard periods, which go back at least to the Reagan era, and certainly uh, with Clinton and, and uh, the senior Bush, when um, the, the politics of the institutions essentially made it impossible to govern. And so uh, we got accustomed to governing by executive orders. Uh, and it wasn't until Trump that we looked on the other side of the executive orders and said, oh my goodness, all of that stuff that we did by executive order, guess what, can be undone by executive order. And that's largely where Trump uh, has done most of the damage. Uh, plus, uh, and, and I'll say this and then, then again slide by it so we can get to, uh, to what uh, you're concerned about. But the... Um, Boy, we should have known something was up in those first six months of the Trump administration when we saw those people that he appointed to government. And I'll leave it at that. Uh, but uh, goodness, uh, is, was there ever an era in, in contemporary American politics where the national government was led by uh, so much ineptitude uh, and confusion uh, as during the Trump administration? So um, go, go past that then to, to the questions that, 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 that you're raising, uh, which I interpret as uh, how, how do we create within this uh, mishmash uh, an understanding of what our uh, national purposes might be and the uh, role that, um, that education could conceivably play in this. And here I think, uh, and, and um, uh, slide over to another uh, function of, um, of, of uh, analyzing politics. And that is to say, uh, what are the discourses? Who creates them? Who promotes them? How are they conducted, et cetera? So we have lived in the last four years with the reality show uh, discourse. Uh, and, and, and that is the subject unto itself, how that has unmade politics. Um, what I see Biden trying to do and the appointments that he is uh, try, trying to make is, um, uh, is, is to create a new discursive uh, structure for government. Uh, some of what you read is that, is that this, this will be based upon uh, regarding people with dignity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
But beyond that, I think it is uh, the, the people that I see uh, and, and listen to uh, when they show up on uh, TV talking about their appointments, um, what, what I see uh, common amongst them is that we have to create, uh, once again, a discourse, which is not uh, uh, first and foremost about blame, uh, second, uh, is not about uh, the bet noir, the, 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 the secret um, force which has made everything bad, but which seeks to return uh, the notions of, of rationality and purpose uh, to the governmental process. Uh, that I see as, as really uh, the beginning of reestablishing what I would call civil discourse in the society. Now, what education has to do with this at all levels is uh, moving us away uh, in bits and pieces from, um, from the damage which has been done by a culture of, uh, of name calling, uh, of once again, uh, all, all the BS that goes on uh, on a television uh, made up show as opposed to uh, efforts in the real world to try to get real stuff done. Um, uh, that's going to be a long process, Jay. I'm not uh, entirely success uh, 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 optimistic that it can succeed. But once again, I see that the, um, the basic structure of what uh, Biden is trying to do is to reestablish the legitimacy of civil discourse, allowing us to speak to each other again about our differences our legitimate differences uh, without uh, demonizing uh, the other uh, in the process. Uh, and that I think is, is uh, at the end of the day, um, the significant damage that the Trump administration has done is to demonize the other. And that's what autocrats do throughout the world, that they need the target. Uh, and sure, they, they, they're trying to control the information of course. with lies. Um, they're um, trying to control the press. You know, the first thing we do is uh, not kill all the lawyers, it's kill all the press. Then we kill the lawyers, you know, yeah. Shakespeare. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, the, the problem, I see two practical problems here. One is the education system has, in fact, been profoundly damaged. It is profoundly damaged. It's pointing in the wrong direction. We may have some very talented uh, teachers and faculty, but, but the, uh, it has generated 70 million people plus, you know, who, who uh, don't want to engage in civil discourse, who are into name calling and who follow him around like, like Jim Jones uh, in Guyana. Uh, some of them would die for him. Um, that, you know, it's hard to argue. It's hard to reason with somebody who is, uh, you know, in, in that place. So we have a problem in terms of the educational system as it is. We've had some really bad, you know, uh, bureaucracy on education in recent years under Trump anyway. Um, and now we first thing we have to do is fix it. So so at least it can teach, you know, reason and collaboration and social compact. Then we have the problem of how long does that take, Dean? How long does it take to educate or re-educate a country of 70 million of which are off the, are off the side? clearly by the vote, it, you, you can see it happening. Um, and, and the third question I suppose is, <clears throat> this goes back to Charles Dickens and the ghost of Christmas future. Do we have enough time in the useful life of our democracy in the remaining life of our democracy to undertake this task? You know, in order to teach a country different things, you have to start early. You have to teach a lot of people, a lot of things, and have them change their way of thinking. I think that's really necessary. And we don't have, do we have the time for that? Can we do that? Would that I knew, would that I knew. Um, I, the way that you have framed the issue makes me um, want to underscore again, the idea that exists within our heads as, as parents, uh, as, as citizens, uh, 
as people with occupations about what education is for. Uh, now we started ruining uh, education long before Trump uh, because we allowed ourselves uh, throughout the 70s and the 80s, particularly within uh, the, the Reagan <coughs> uh, transformation of political economy, although we didn't talk about it that way, uh, into a world in which we thought that uh, the purpose of education is to get a job. Uh, without having the capacity or the willingness uh, to raise the question, what the heck are the jobs that we're supposed to be educating for? And you and I have had a bit of this conversation about what it means to take 14 million people and stick them in the bitty economy uh, and then say, well, we've taken care of that. Uh, you know, uh, what we did was to take job security as, as, a, as a goal and allow that to be um, uh, just trashed by the incursion, uh, particularly of uh, high tech, but high tech within the global economy. And you and I have had conversations previously uh, about the other part of that before the pandemic and before Trump that was going to make this uh, a dilemma. And that's the incursion of artificial intelligence upon the world that we're creating. So we put all of these bundles together and boy, it's going to be an interesting time um, in the next couple of years. Um, and I think that the, um, the conversations that are going on within higher education, oddly, as a result of the enormous discontinuities that the virus has, has provoked um, in them, has forced them in a way that nothing else has to raise the question uh, what are we here for and what are we going to do and how are we going to do it? Uh, the data that I look at indicate that as much as 25% uh, of four-year institutions in the United States uh, may not survive this financially. Um, well, that's one part of the equation. The other part of the equation is what are the other 75 going to learn as a lesson from that? Uh, so, um, we, uh, I, I picked up uh, a, a book the other day, I got to tell it to you and I got to tell it to uh, everyone who might be listening and watching to this, Barbara Tuckman's uh, A Distant Mirror. Of course, uh, one of my favorites. Fantastic book. Uh, uh, we need to ask ourselves in the way that she uh, raises the question, uh, what is this century about? Um, and, and as uh, a century of, of extraordinary transformation, uh, it leads us uh, inevitably to the question uh, of, uh, of, of what do we want to be? So, uh, so the ghost of Christmas past, yes, do we have enough time? But in addition to that, do we have enough time for what? And this is precisely the time in our history where all of these events have led us to uh, a reconsideration of the what. And in a democracy, in a functioning democracy, that question is never an innocent question and it's never an easy question. So even in the best of circumstances, we would find ourselves debating at the most fundamental level, the values that we want to promote in a radically changing world. Um, and then you put into the equation, the toxic elements that we've been talking about uh, and it's unprecedented, perhaps as unprecedented until we go back to the 14th century. Uh, but uh, we have to, you know, my takeaway from that is that we have to um, ask ourselves the question uh, in, in these new terms of discourse, uh, what, can, what can we consider and how can we consider them in a way that is not usual and conventional? Uh, the other thing I'm reading uh, is our uh, friend from Funahoe's uh, book, uh, uh, Mr. Obama's 700-page uh, first uh, first mm -hmm. book. Just uh, out. Oh, the yeah. old one. Okay. Right, right. And he talks uh, inter alia uh, uh, again and again in there about what he discovered uh, about himself in writing the book. Uh, what, what was that inner discourse that he was uh, overlooking even when he was, as it were, in the midst of the action? 
Uh, and that's what I think uh, we started this by talking about what creates a better uh, education. And in, in part of my understanding of a better education is um, asking the people who uh, exit on the other side to have uh, learned the humility to say to themselves on a regular basis, um, what don't I know and what do I need to know and what do I know <laughs> that may simply not be true and I got to get rid of it whether I know it or not. Well, you know, that's the, that's the ultimate problem to, uh, to get people to think about that. Yeah. Uh, there's going to be resistance and that's, that's the first step. The first step is to have people consider what they need to consider. <laughs> anyway, you know, there's so much to talk about here, Dean, and I would like to uh, rejoin with you uh, in a few weeks and uh, we'll see how things um, spill over in terms of the, uh, the, the political uh, science side of things, the social science side of things, and maybe we can uh, find, find new, I'm sure we can find new topics to discuss. Thank you so much. Dean Neubauer, appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for asking me, Jay. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Dean. Aloha.